we discuss these things, but there's never an absolute of you must no. do this or this is safe or whatever. But there's people who will talk about these things and make them gospel that well, everyone should be taking a GLP and everyone should be doing this, that and the other, that just no way you could make these absolute statements towards stuff that are existed mm -hmm. for maybe, I think Lyra Glutide was released 15, 16 years ago, I think. It always surprises me, like now with the GLP-1 receptor agonist in this mitochondrial support stack that people still cannot get in shape. Because it, it's it, so goddamn just, fucking easy on them. They're eating, it's so easy. They're just easy. going to McDonald's three times a day, to McDonald's one time a day. Right? The, the majority yeah. of the women in the United States use a GLP are, are still doing as much cocaine and drinking Diet Coke as they were before <laughs> the GLP. Yeah. It's just, they're yeah. shit food. They don't exercise, right? When that study we looked at last video, we ranked these things. Right. Was the initial, what was the first statement? It was about the population that uses GLP drugs. If they would simply exercise, they would yeah. not experience the side effects that you experience with these drugs, but no one wants to do yeah. that. Yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. Then it gets a bad rep. Yeah, I lost my vision on GLP ones. So well, you stopped eating well, any kind of nutrition I, foods, and now you're, you know, <laughs> bad carotene and was in vitamin A. <laughs> I was in a meeting with pharmacists uh, it, it, since our last video, and mm. we were discussing GLPs and the. At least the stance in the United States is that we don't know the long term effects of any of these drugs. So no doctor, no pharmacist, no scientist, at least in the United States, can tell you that a GLP drug is safe long term. We don't know. Right. We've not. These drugs are rushed to the market. They continually rush to the market and they're not necessarily safe. That I'm not saying don't use them. I'm saying just be aware that especially if someone online is telling you that these are perfectly harmless, they're full mm -hmm. of shit. We don't mm -hmm. know that. No one can tell you that. Yeah. Oh, there's right. plenty there's of side effects in, in the scientific evidence, you know. I mean, I, when I did a retroglutide deep dive, or even when I talked about lyroglutide, terzepidide back in the day, you know, you go through all the side effects and, and how you can mitigate them by just following a healthy lifestyle. doesn't mean that they're not there. Like, I just did my blood work to see what, because I haven't used a GLP-1 receptor agonist for a while, so I started back with retroglutide to make the diet a little bit more tolerable so that my mood stays intact. And it's either hardcore dieting in no mood, or using a GLP-1 to suppress the appetite and then my mm -hmm. mood is high. So it's, you know, it, it, I'm trying to find a fucking balance. <laughs> so that's why I use them because my mood is so much better on a GLP-1, even though a lot of guys get depression on it, which is yeah, weird. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen the research around that, which is quite fascinating with the mm. disruption to serotonin metabolism more so. Yeah. Um, and dopamine as well. And the, the some of the suicidal tendencies that they're they're trying to postulate towards terzepatide more so is what you see mm -hmm. a lot of anecdotal uh, reports surrounding like increases in anxiety and then the anxiety triggering off uh, night not nice thoughts um so like kurt said we we talk about these things we talk about mechanistic actions but yeah it's it's very well true that uh, like us we we discuss these things, but there's never an absolute of you must no. do this or this is safe or whatever. There's, but there's people who will talk about these things and make them gospel that well, everyone should be taking a GLP and everyone should be doing this, that and the other, that just no way you could make these absolute statements towards stuff that are existed mm -hmm. for maybe, I think Lyra Glutide was released 15, 16 years ago, I think. Off the top of my head, it's not, it's not too yeah, long. Before it hit the market, I think it was first, I first started using it about four years ago. Yeah, four years, because it was about six months before the Olympia. And then I started talking about it. Nobody talked about it, about lyroglutide and semaglutide. And then I went to the Olympia and it was on all the billboards. Ozempic. Ozempic everywhere. I was like, what the, did, was this, is this my fault? Because <laughs> nobody talked about it back then. So it's, it's only been around for four years and, and you see plenty of issues, but that's always, or most of the time, in people who are unhealthy to begin with. So yes. they were diabetic but, or, or they had, you know, two, lifestyle two, issues. To Dean's point though, I think it, it, the drug was invented a long time ago. It, the drug was invented yeah. a long time ago. It just didn't come to the public eye. Like all these drugs, most of the time you don't see them for years. There, there's a process for the FDA to approve something. So I've right. just looked it up there. Lyroglutide was approved by the FDA in 2010 for the US and 2009 oh, okay. for the EU. So it's been around, like I said, about 15 years that these sort of 
first line things that were designed for type 2 diabetes, we just started to make the connection between the GLP-1 receptor improving pancreatic function and then as a consequence, ghrelin becoming suppressed. Mm. Yeah. Um, that now, obviously, we're looking at <clears throat> using these compounds from a an appetite suppression perspective as opposed to type 2 diabetes and a pancreatic effect that I think slowly over time these things will will be classed as well they're already classed but they will become anti-obesity drugs as opposed mm -hmm. to diabetic drugs because I think right now in terms of how they're discussed it's here's a diabetic drug that you can take off label which will suppress your appetite do well, you do you think they're going to make a combination with AOD nine six zero four? Well, the way it's going <laughs> and bioglutides, eventually you're going to have yeah. this big giant protein that just serves bloody everything, and then maybe you're getting <laughs> close to like what Kurt is on about with exercise memetics. That you just got this big giant protein that has all these peptide chains coming off it. Um, yeah. <laughs> It just which, diffuses it to like 20 different <laughs> peptides. Which, which if anyone, if anyone has any background in like drug development, creating protein drugs is a big, big, big wormhole in yeah. that if the protein incorrectly folds, you are yeah. F-U-C-K-E-D. Yeah. So yeah. like it's, uh, it, it's a pipe dream. A few moments later. Welcome to the Anabolic Roundtable, episode 15, part two. We had some technical difficulties the last time, and then uh, scheduling happened. Uh, Kurt got busy, and Dean got busy, and I got busy, and now we're back for part two. Uh, we were talking about bioglutide, and I believe in the meantime, uh, people are actually trying that, but I'm still not convinced that, that the bioglutide that's on the market is actually real, because <laughs> there's no cast number. And the people that have been trying it so far, they've reported not really astronomical effects. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Did you guys hear anything in the meantime? No. Not really, just, right? I just saw people are shown with the oral bioglutides, uh, whatever it is, SS, whatever the code name is of it. Uh, yeah, and NA931, uh, I think. Yeah, sorry. So, yeah. I, I mean... Time will tell when this, alongside the other uh, mega dosing experiments we're seeing come out. Well, I'm I'm sitting in anticipation, watching of what's going to happen. With obviously, the popularity of the high dose SLU, and I think you're going to try it, Steve. I'm on it right now. now let me tell I you this: that. it's it's easy to get lean and difficult to get fat. <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically like dnp and my hands are very clammy and sweaty and it's very easy to get flat also um so i had to increase my carbs and fat loss is just continuous so when my mom was here for three weeks uh obviously eat a little bit more off diet she wanted to eat thai food and italian and japanese and she wanted to, she had a whole list of restaurants ready so we went to all of them and i'm no longer at a point where i bring tupperware um, so, you know, if I go out to a restaurant, I'm just going to eat. And normally I would just get chunky in that setting, but I didn't. So that's that's a first. After three weeks of eating in restaurants, I, I barely gained any fat. So it took me one week to get back on the program, and I'm continuously losing fat. So I did some blood work after the four-week mark, but I was also on trend. So I saw that my cystatin and C went up slightly. That always mm -hmm. happens to me when I'm on the trim bologna sandwich and now do blood work again in, I think this weekend or the weekend after and then I'll release a video about high dose SLU, but so far so good. I didn't see any negative effects besides my wallet being drained because it's not cheap, but it's cheaper than, you know, doing the, the capsules because I got the powder from China, obviously. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so far so good, but I'll do some blood work and then I'll make a video about it and then draw my conclusions.